All right, hello, I'm Rex, this is test six. Before we start, I'm gonna outline all of the rules that there are for SAT reading. Okay, ready? Number one, don't lie. That's it, let's go. Another man might have thrown up his hands, but not Nawab did. Positive paragraph. His 12 daughters spurred, acted as a spur to his genius and he looked, to the satis he looked with satisfaction in the mirror each morning at the face. At the face of a warrior going out to do battle? Okay. Nawab, of course, knew that he must proliferate his sources of revenue. The salary he received from K.K. Haruni for tending the two wells would not even begin to suffice. Oh, negative now, huh? He set up a little one-room flour mill run off a condemned electric motor, condemned by him. He tried his hand at fish farming in a little pond at the edge of his master's fields. He bought broken radios, fixed them, and resold them. He did not demur even when asked to fix watches, though that enterprise did spectacularly badly and, in fact, earned him more kicks than kudos for no watch he took apart, ever kept time again. So, started positive. Pivoted negative, sadly stayed that way. K.K. Haruni rarely went to his farms, but lived mostly in Lahore. Neutral, I guess? Whenever the old man visited, Nawab would place himself night and day at the door leading from the servant's sitting area into the walled grove of ancient banyan trees where the old farmhouse stood. Grizzled his peculiar aviator glasses Glass, his peculiar, peculiar aviator glasses, benched and bent and smudged. Nawab tended the household machinery, the air conditioners, water heaters, refrigerators, and water pumps. He's like, he's stylish. Uh, like an engineer tending the boilers on a foundering steamer in an Atlantic gale, by his superhuman efforts, he almost managed to maintain K.K. Haruni in the same mechanical cocoon, cooled and bathed and lighted and fed, that the landowner enjoyed in Lahore. More positive. Nice. Always happy to see a positive paragraph. Haruni, of course, became familiar with this ubiquitous man, who not only accompanied him on his tour of inspection, but morning and night could be found standing on the master bed, rewiring the light fixture in the bathroom, poking at the water heater. So, okay. Positive? Neutral? Weaker positive, positive. Finally, one evening at tea time, gauging the psychological moment, Nawab asked if he might say a word. The landowner, who was cheerfully filing his nails in front of a crackling rosewood fire, told him to go ahead. How do you file your nails cheerfully? I've never seen that in my whole life. I've never even heard of that, but anyway. Sir, as you know, your lands stretch from here to the Indus, and on these lands are fully 17 tube wells, and to tend these 17 tube wells, there is but one man, me, your servant. In your service, I have earned these gray hairs. Here he bowed to show the gray. And now I cannot fulfill my duties as I should. Enough, sir, enough. I beg you, forgive me my weakness. Better a darkened house and proud hunger within than disgrace in the light of day. Release me, I ask you, I beg you. A little dramatic there, Nawab, but okay. The old man, well accustomed to these sorts of speeches, though not usually this florid, see, they, it's, even the passage says it's dramatic, uh, florid means flowery, but I'm going to take that as they're agreeing with me, filed away at his nails and waited for the breeze to stop. What's the matter, Nawabdin? Uh, scrolling down. Matter, sir. Oh, what could be the matter in your service? I've eaten your salt for all my years, high sodium diet, good for you. But sir, on the bicycle now, with my old legs and with the many injuries I've received when heavy machinery fell on me, I cannot any longer bicycle about like a bridegroom from farm to farm as I could. When I first had the good fortune to enter your employment, I beg you, sir, let me go. That sounds like a horrible accident, having heavy machinery fall. Okay, anyway. And what's the solution, asked Haruni, seeing that they had come to the crux. He didn't particularly care one way or the other, except that it touched on his comfort, a matter of great interest to him. Okay, so Haruni a little selfish. Well, sir, if I had a motorcycle, then I could somehow limp a log at least until I train up some younger men. The crops that year had been good. Haruni felt expansive in front of the fire, and so, much to the disgust of the farm managers, Nawab received a brand new motorcycle, a Honda Civic, Honda 70. He even managed to extract an allowance for gasoline. The motorcycle increased his status, gave him weight so that people began calling him uncle and asking his opinion on world affairs, about which he knew absolutely nothing. Okay, that's pretty uh, extreme and negative. He could now range further, doing a much wider business. Best of all, now he could spend every night with his wife. Oh, extreme sentence again. These might be important details. Who knows? Uh, best of all, he could now spend every night with his wife, who had begged to live to live not on the farm, but near her family in Feroza, where they could educate at least two, at least the two elder daughters. Where they could educate at least the two elder daughters. Why don't the younger kids get education? Education's important. Nawab. A long straight road ran from the canal head works near Feroza all the way to the Indus through the heart of the KK Haruni lands. Nawab would fly down this road on his new machine with bags and cloths hanging from every knob and brace so that the bike, when he hit a bump, seemed to be flapping numerous small vestigial wings and with his, and with his grinning face as he rolled to whichever tube well needed servicing, with his ears almost blown off, he shone with the speed of his arrival. Good for you, Nawab. Nice. I like that story. That was interesting. The main purpose of the first paragraph is to... 
uh, he was going to like he he was he was going into battle like whenever he was confronting the new day and then his enterprises went badly. Characterized as loving father, I don't know how that would be the entire paragraph. Outline the schedule of a typical day. I don't know why it's typical. Described and there's very it's probably that. Contrast, no, I, yeah, they haven't mentioned Haruni yet. So see, next as used in line sixteen, kicks most nearly means. Let's go check. He did not demur even when asked to fix watches, though that enterprise did spectacularly badly, and in fact earned him more kicks than kudos. Like, like, people were mad at him. Not the opposite of praise. Okay. They earned him more thrills. No, too positive. They end complaints. Probably Jolts, not physical. Kicks. Like, I don't think they actually kicked him, so Jolts is weird in its B. The author uses the image of an engineer at C, 23 to 28, most likely two. Oh, this is like the more positive part where they're talking about how he's doing a lot of work, and he's wearing his stylish aviators. He tends to the house with the air conditioners, water, and like an engineer tuning. Uh, yeah, so he's doing a lot of hard work and he's doing a good job. Suggest that Nawab often dreams of having. Okay, I don't know what that is. Highlight the fact that Nawab's primary job is to tend Haruni's two wells. I don't know about it's his primary job, but let's see. Reinforce the idea that Nawab has had many different. Okay, no, get out of here. Emphasize how demanding Nawab's work for Haruni. I think it's that, right? He works hard. Which choice best supports the claim that Nawab performs his duties for Haruni well? Okay, we need to find one that's explicitly positive. 28 to 32. By his superhuman efforts, he almost managed to maintain... Okay, it's that. It's A. I know I should check the rest, but for speedrun's sake, we go. Five. In the context of the conversation... Highly irresponsible. In the context of this conversation between Nawab and Haruni, Nawab's comments in lines 43 to 52 mainly serve to... Oh, oh, dramatically say, oh my gosh, my hair turned gray. Look, you can even see it. I think that he's asking him for a, he's, he might be trying to, uh, to coax him, prepare him. Let's see, so uh, prepare him into getting, giving him a motorcycle or whatever. All right, so flatter Haruni by mentioning how vast his lands, maybe flatter, but I don't know the mentioning the vast lands part. Like, uh, we'll see. Boast to Haruni about how competent, he's not, it's too negative. Like, he, he was kind of like, I know he was dramatic, but he was still very like respectful about the way he did it. Emphasize Nawab's diligence and loyalty to Haruni. Hmm. Notify Haruni that Nawab tends to quit. He's a servant. He, there's no way he's going to quit, right? So this is, I think, C. I just want to make sure that it's not A. I'm going to go look back. Compromising the speed run, but let's see. 470. Yeah, we can't say that an entire thing is flattering him, especially the part where he's like, dude, look at my gray hair. It's like, you're making me stressed out and get old. Okay, I'm pretty sure it's C. Six, Nawab uses the word bridegroom in line 62, mainly to emphasize he's no, wasn't it like he's old, he's young? He's old now. He said, I can't, mo I can't run around like a bridegroom. 62, yeah. In love, yeah, okay. Now, young D. It can reasonably be inferred from the passage that Haruni provides Nawab with a motorcycle mainly because Nawab appreciates that, that Nawab has to work hard. Just, I think it was, well, let's see. So let's see if there's any answer choices that we can get rid of. He appreciates, didn't it say he didn't care? Like, literally. Haruni sees Ben, it might be that, I think. The Nawab's speech is the most eloquent. Please don't pick extreme answer choices. It never said that it was the most eloquent thing he's ever heard in his entire life, in the entire universe ever. That's what most eloquent would mean. Nawab threatens to quit if he can't quit. He's a servant. Okay, so wait, I'm pretty sure this is B. Oh, and lo and behold, it's paired, so good. Yeah, pro tip, make sure you look at the, all the questions. So eight, let's see which one. It was the, there was a contrast in that sentence that kind of like made me notice it. So let's see, 65, 66, I don't think it's there. It was around like line 65, I think. Which is what that said. Okay, never mind. So just don't. What's the solution? Seeing they come to the crop. He has. It, it hasn't said it yet. So we need the next sentence here, where it says explicitly he didn't care one way or the other. Otherwise, College Board's going to accuse me of lying, and I don't like it when College Board accuses me of lying. All right. So the, I think that this one is B. The passage states that the farm managers react to Nawab's receiving a motorcycle. Weren't they disgusted? A. Okay. According to the passage, what does Nawab consider to be the best result of getting the motorcycle? Oh, wasn't it he could visit his wife? D, let me just double check. He best of all, he can now spend every night with his wife. Okay, I think it's D, onwards. The news is a form of public knowledge, unlike personal or private knowledge, such as the health of one's friends and family. Health of, okay. Unlike personal or private knowledge, I thought, I read, I was still thinking that they were saying that's public knowledge, and I was like, what? Such as the health of one's friends and family, the conduct of a private hobby, a secret liaison, public knowledge increases in value as it's shared by more people. 
The date of an election and the claims of rival candidates, the causes and consequences of environmental disaster, a debate on how to frame a particular law, the latest reports from a war zone, these are all examples of public knowledge that people are generally expected to know in order to be considered informed citizens. Thus, in contrast, contrast, to personal or private knowledge, which generally is left to individuals to pursue or ignore, public knowledge is promoted even to those who might not think it matters to them. In short, the circulation of public knowledge, including the news, is generally regarded as a public good which cannot be solely demand-driven. Okay, so public knowledge, important. The production, circulation, and reception of public knowledge is a complex process. Okay, so making public knowledge paragraph. It's generally accepted that public knowledge would be authoritative, but there's not always common agreement about what the public needs to know. Who is best placed to relate and explain it, and how authoritative reputations, how authoritative reputations should be determined and evaluated? How that was a weird way to phrase it. Shouldn't they said like, and how reputations should be determined and evaluated to be authoritative or something like that? Anyway. Historically, newspapers such as The Times and broadcasters such as the BBC were widely regarded as the trusted shapers of authoritative agendas and conventional wisdom. They embodied the Oxford English Dictionary's definition of authority as the power over or title to influence the opinions of others. Really? I thought power was about influencing the actions of others, right? Because if I just made, if I have the power to change people's opinions, but then they still act in a way that's contrary to how I want, then isn't that not power? Nice, digression is finished. As part of the general process of the transformation of authority, whereby there has been a reluctance to uncritically accept traditional sources of public knowledge, the demand has been for all authority to make explicit the frames of values which determine their decisions. Interesting, extreme sentence, probably an important sentence. The centers of news productions, as our focus groups show, have not been exempt from this process. Not surprisingly, Perhaps some news journalists feel uneasy about this renegotiation of their authority, colon, let me tell you how. Editors are increasingly casting a glance at the most read lists, the most read lists on their own and other websites to work out which stories matter to readers and viewers. And now the audience, which used to know its place, is being asked to act as a kind of journalistic ombudsman, ruling our credibility. How dare we? The results of democratizing access to TV news could be political disengagement by the majority and a dumbing down theory popularity contest of stories. And oh my God, there's like a buzzing outside my window, which is super loud. I hope the mic doesn't pick it up. If it has been this whole time, I'm sorry. Despite the rhetorical bluster of these statements, they amount to more than straightforward professional defensiveness. Oh, wait, so he's on, the author's on their side a little bit? In their reference to an audience which used to know its place and conflation between democratization and dumbing down, they're seeking to argue for a particular mode of public knowledge, one which is shaped by experts immune from populist pressures and disseminated to attentive but mainly passive recipients. It's a view of citizenship that closes down opportunities for popular involvement in the making of public knowledge by reinforcing the professional claims of experts. The journalists quoted, they are right to feel uneasy, for there is at almost every institutional level in contemporary society skepticism with a C towards Towards the epistemological authority of expert elites. What? Where is this from? Stephen, maybe, I don't know if that's like a British spelling or something. There's a growing feeling as expressed by several of our focus group participants that the news media should be informative rather than authoritative. The job of journalists should be to give the news as raw as it is without putting their slants on it and people should be given sufficient information for which we would be able to form opinions of our own. Okay, people want to think for themselves. They don't want to be told what to think. At stake here are two distinct conceptions of authority. The journalists we have quoted are resistant to the democratization of news, the supremacy of the click stream, according to which editor raise, which reddit, editors, which redditors, yeah, which redditors raise or lower the profile of stories according to the number of readers clicking on them online. The parody of popular culture with serious news, the demands of some audience members for raw news rather than constructed narratives. Okay. Nice. A uh, weird looking graph I scrolled by and then now onwards. 11, the main purpose of the passage is to analyze technical developments that have affected the production circulation. It's not, the whole thing wasn't about production. Didn't they just mention production in the second paragraph and the rest they were just talking about like theoretically what news stories should, what kind of like, in what manner they should convey the information. So I think A is weird. Discuss the changes in the perception of news media as a source of a, maybe. Show how a journalist frames the production. It's not the whole passage, man. And D, challenge the conventional view that news is a form of, why would, didn't they admit that it's public knowledge right at the beginning? And then that's why they're talking about how we should like present it to B. Let me just make sure B is the one that I think it is. But yeah, discuss changes in the perception of news. Yep. According to the passage, which expectation do traditional authorities now face? 
They have to be like they have to give the news like when like raw. They should be uninfluenced by commercial consideration. I don't think they mentioned commercial stuff, but I'll check with the lines. I'm just doing seeing if I can get rid of anything in twelve first. Uh, they should be committed to bringing about positive social. That's definitely not stated. They should be respectful of the difference between public and private knowledge. They only mentioned private knowledge like in the first paragraphs. So I don't think so. They should be transparent about their. I think it's probably G, but we'll check. So let's see if we got two to five. Or is it unlike resident? Okay, so like two, uh, 13A is the one that's supposed to go with like the, the public private knowledge C, but we know 12 is not C. So 20 to 21, the production circulation is a complex process. Doesn't say like what the expectation of the traditional authorities now face is. It's a paired question. You want to make sure that this 13's answer choice is answer 12's question. 33 to 38, one, two, three, as part of the general positive chance person who read. The demand has been for all authority to make explicit. Oh, I think it's that. I think it's 12, I think it's 12D with 13C, but I'll check 13D also. Editors are increasingly casting a glance at the most read lit. This is not the traditional stuff, right? Like this isn't, this doesn't match 12's question. The expectation of traditional authorities now face. I think it's D and 13C. 14, as used in line 24, common most nearly means. It is a generally accepted that public knowledge should be authoritative, but there's not always common agreement about what the, like there isn't always like agreement with everyone. Uh, 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 not a great target word, but something like that. Uh, numerous agreements sound weird. Don't pick anything that sounds weird in vocab. Familiar agreement? No. Or okay, it's C. The authors would most likely include the extended most likely include the extended quotations in line forty-three to forty-five too. Uh, oh, interesting. This was the thing that started with the colon, wasn't it? Where they said, yeah, right, right on line forty-two. They're like renegotiating of their. Not surprisingly, perhaps some newsrooms feel uneasy about this renegotiation of their authority, and then they're like, "Let me tell you why." And then they gave these two examples. So I think it's like to give a couple of examples that complete what the colon is supposed to do. Present. I don't know if they're contradictory there. That's a bit of a strong word, no. Cite representative, like a dissenting opinion, is not like contradictory, right? So okay, cite representative opinions. Maybe criticize typical view. I don't think they're typical. Yeah, because like usually the news was trusted, and so the typical viewpoint would have been for the editors to just be like, "Yeah, you should, guys should just listen to us." So this what that that quote is a is evocative or of a uh, recent development, right? Evocative. I don't know if that's the right word for that, but all right. I suggest viable alternatives. No, it's just giving his like examples. I think it's B. The authors indicate that the public is coming to believe that journalist reports should avoid bias, personal judge, I think, <laughs> more, maybe. B, information that's absolutely necessary. I think that this is crazy. I don't even know how you would go about distinguishing what is absolutely necessary, given that the concept of that which is absolutely necessary is extreme in and of itself. Like, like how would you know if you're writing a story which details are absolutely necessary or not? That seems super subjective. Quotations from authorities on the subject matter. Oh, uh, weird. Okay. Details from the subjects of news reports. Details that the subjects of news reports that the subject wish to keep private? I think it's A. Is this paired also? And oh, it's paired also. Nice. I didn't learn my lesson from the first, pa the first uh, passage. It's all to 16. I still think that 16 is A, but let's see. I'm going to start from the bottom, I think, because given that we're close to line, like 18 is line 74. So maybe these are following the line rule. Let's see. 70 to 74. There's a growing feeling as expressed by several that the news media should be informed. Oh, it might be. Okay. This is nice. 40 to 42. The bug stopped for a second. It got my hopes up. Not surprisingly. Okay, it's not that. It doesn't have anything to do with not being biased. 30 to 33. I'm pretty sure that it's D, but we'll check just for the sake of being safe. Safety is always good. I don't think it's B, 12 to 16. Oh my goodness. Okay, it's none of these. Yeah. Okay, so then 17 is D. 16 is, what was the one? I think it's 16 is A, 17 D. A good example of the line rule coming into play here. If you guys didn't know, then typically on the, the SAT, they ask questions in like sequential order. So question 18 is about line 74, and then question 17 is going to be before line 74 uh, much of the time. And you can see that line 17D like starts from line 70, so a little bit before. Uh, based on the table, which in which year were people the most trusting of the news media? Let's go look at that graph that I completely glazed over. 
trust the news, represent the news sources is inaccurate or favoring one side. Okay, so they get the facts straight, it's high to low. Often, you know, often have inaccurate stories, low to high, don't, oh. Are pretty independent, are often influenced, are, oh, oh, wow, we hate the news nowadays. Everything's trending like in a bad way. So all of the good things, all of the good sentiment that we had towards news is going down and all of the negative sentiment is going up. That's kind of what I'm getting. So I'm guessing the answer is like 1985, it's the beginning. A, 20, which statement is best supported by the information presented in the table between 1985 and 2011 to proportion inaccurate news stories rose dramatically? This, hmm, this sounds to me like a trap. Because when I was looking at this graph just for the previous question, I didn't, like the thought crossed my mind that I didn't know how, what the exact number is, uh, what the exact number of uh, inaccurate news stories was. I just know like what people's opinions are. I think that College Board's trying to be sneaky here. This one smells like a trap because I'm not sure how I can tell if what the actual proportion of inaccurate news stories is. If a lot of people think that they're inaccurate, maybe the story's still accurate though. I don't know if people's opinions are weird. Between 1992 and 2003, the proportion of people who believe that news organizations were biased almost doubled. Sounds easy to true, false. 1992, 2003, biased? Okay, I, I guess that's the, I think that's the uh, deal fairly with all sides or tend to favor one side, right? But in either case, is it double? I think that's wrong. 2003 to 2007, the people's views of the accuracy, independence, and fairness of news has changed very little? What was it? Accuracy, fairness, accuracy, independence, fairness, 2003, 2007. Accuracy, fairness, accuracy, they make me jump all over the board. Change rate of 56 to 53, maybe? Yeah, 26 to 26, 60, oh, actually, possibly. Between 2007 and 2011, people's perceptions that news organizations are accurate increased. Uh, probably not, but people's perception that news organizations are fair diminished. I don't think that they thought it's more accurate, but we will check. Accurate? Oh my God, they want me to think that inaccurate means accurate. Sneaky college board. Pretty sure this one's C. Nice try. All right, 21. The 2011 data in the graph best serve as evidence of political disengagement by the majority. Didn't mention politics, it just said the news. Professional expert, the professional claims of expert, didn't mention experts in the graph. Skepticism with a C towards the epistemological authority of expert elites. Maybe, because they're being distrustful of how the authorities know what they know, and that's what epistemology is. It's like the study of how you know what you know. I'm sure that's a great definition that everyone's going to be thrilled with. The supremacy of the click street. Okay, well, I think it's C. Onwards. It's by Elsa. Okay. Texas gourd vines unfurl their large flared blossoms in the dim hours before sunrise. Until they close at noon, their yellow, their yellow petals and mild squashy aroma attract bees that gather nectar and shuttle pollen from flower to flower. But when you advertise to pollinators, you advertise in an open communication network, says chemical ecologist Ian Baldwin of the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Germany. You attract not just the good guys, but you also attract the bad guys. For a Texas gourd plant, striped cucumber beetles are among the very bad guys. They chew up pollen and petals, defecate in the flowers, and transmit the dreaded bacterial wilt disease, an infection that can reduce an entire plant to a heap of collapsed tissue in mere days. Oh my goodness, these beetles. One recent study, Nina, in one recent study, Nina Fayez and Lynn Adler took on the specific problem of the Texas gourd, how to attract enough pollinators, but not too many beetles. Cool. The Texas gourd vine's main pollinators are honeybees and specialized squash bees, which respond to its floral scent. The aroma includes 10 compounds, but the most abundant, ooh, not only is this extreme, most abundant, it's also a contrast, but this is like a very important sentence. And the o it's an extreme again, the only one that lures squash bees into traps, I'll bet you that that's an important sentence, but we'll see, is one for dimethoxybenzene. Dimethoxybenzene, I think, I don't know. Intu intuition suggests that more of that aroma should be even more appealing to bees. So increase aroma, increase bees, okay. We have this assumption that a really fragrant flower is going to attract a lot of pollinators, says Thea, as a chemical ecologist at Elms College in Chicopee, Massachusetts. That's where I'm from. Well, I mean, Massachusetts, I'm not from Chicopee. But she adds, that idea hasn't really been tested and ex and extra scent could well call in more beetles too, okay. So she's not sure. It could be it could be good or bad. To find out, she and Adler planted 168 Texas gourd vines in an Iowa field, and throughout the August flowering season, made half of the plants more fragrant by tucking dimetha, whatever, treated swabs deep inside their flowers. Each treated flower emitted about 45 times more fragrance than a normal one. The other half of the plants got swabs without fragrance. Okay, they made them smell very, very strongly. 
The researchers also wanted to know whether extra beetles would impose a double cost by both damaging flowers and deterring bees, which might not bother which might not bother to visit and pollinate a flower laden with other insects and their feces. I can see why. So every half hour throughout the experiments, the team plucked all of the beetles off of half the fragrance enhanced flowers and half the control flowers, allowing bees to respond to the blossoms with and without interference by beetles. So an additional question, they want to know if the beetles are, have a negative effect. Uh, finally, they pollinated by hand half of the female flowers. In each of the four, everything so many halves. In each of the four combinations of fragrances and uh, fragrance and beetles, hand pollinated flowers should develop into fruits with the maximum number of seeds, providing a benchmark to see whether the fragrance related activities of the bees and beetles resulted in reduced pollination. Great. It was a very labor. It was very labor intensive, said Theus. We would want. We would be out there at four in the morning, three in the morning, to try to set up these flowers before to set, try to set up before these flowers open. As soon as they did, the team spent the next several hours walking from flower to flower, observing each of for two minute intervals and writing down everything we saw. I'll bet you that that's not accurate because I don't know how you wrote down everything you saw. It's a lot of stuff. What they saw was double the normal number of beetles on fragrance enhanced blossoms. Pollinators to the surprise did not prefer the highly scented flowers. Hmm. Squash bees were indifferent and honeybees visited enhanced flowers less often than normal ones. Theus thinks that the bees were repelled not by the fragrance itself, but by the abundance of beetles. Okay, so answering that question that was in paragraph, starting on line 41. Uh, the data shows that the more beetles on a flower, the less likely a honeybee was to visit it. That added up to less reproduction for fragrance-enhanced flowers. Gores that developed from the blossoms weighed 9% less and had on average 20 fewer seeds than those from normal flowers. Hand pollination didn't rescue the seed set, indicating that beetles damaged flowers directly, regardless of whether they also repelled pollinators. A beetle's bad. Hand pollination did rescue fruit weight, a hard-to-interpret result that suggests that lost bee visits did somehow harm fruit development. Okay. The new results provide a reason that Texas gourd plants never evolved to produce a stronger scent, Okay, the main idea is this is why they don't smell stronger. If you really ramp up the odor, you don't get more pollinators, but you can really get ripped apart by your enemy, said Rob Raguso, a chemical ecologist at Cornell University who was not involved in the Texas Gourd study. Okay. The primary purpose of the passage is to discuss the assumption. Is, uh, why would scientists make assumptions like that? Very irresponsible. Describe the A-methane results of an experiment. Present, analyze, conflicting. No, I don't think it's conflicting. Show the innovative nature of a procedure. Use it, I think it's just B, like it was very informative and neutral. As presented in the passage, Theus and Adler's research primarily relied on which type of evidence? Like scientific evidence? Direct observation, historical, not historical, expert testimony, random sample. Okay, so I don't think this is like a criminal case where they're calling like witnesses for expert testimony. Random sampling, I don't think it was random. They, they split it up into two, because it's A, I think. 24, which statement about striped cucumber beetles can be most reasonably inferred from the passage? Oh, they're a dearth. They're horrible. A dearth? That doesn't even make sense. Dearth means scarcity, I think. Okay, they feed primarily on Texas... The primarily part looks suspicious to me. I'm always a little bit on, uh, a little bit uh, weirded out when they give us like more adjectives or adverbs than I feel like they needed to. They could have just said they feed on Texas gourd plants, which would have been true. And then they added primarily, which I think made it a little weaker and then so suspicious. They're less attracted to dimethoxybenzene than honeybees are. I don't know. They experience only minor negative effects as a result of carrying the bacteria. Well, they're attracted to the same compound in the Texas, that's a squash. Hmm. I think that A is wrong. I think that C is also like the next weirdest, the next weird one. Because I remember in the passage they were talking about how they are carriers of bacterial wilt. I guess you could infer from that 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 means that, oh, and they're carrying it and not dying, so they must still be healthy. But the passage didn't say that, and so that would count as a lie. That would break the golden rule for reading. So let's see. Uh, I think I can find, B and D I think are going to be around the same place, right? It's going to be where they talked about the dimethox of whatever it was called. Like li around line 25? The aroma. How do I try pollinate the choices? Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so in their study, they increased the amount of dimethoxybenzene, right? And then that increased the amount of uh, beetles as well. And then so even though answer choice D said the same compound, which means literally exactly the same, which usually would constitute an extreme, it does in this case, it's true because it was literally dimethoxybenzene that they were testing. So I think it is D. Uh, B, I can like pretty much disprove given the fact that when they increased dimethoxybenzene, like the amount of beetles increased, causing the bees to decrease. Yeah. The author indicates that it seems initially plausible that Texas gourd plants could attract more pollinators if they made them smell better, right? 
It, no, not A, it's the opposite target incident. Increase C. Uh, line 38, treated most nearly means. Uh, each treated flower emitted about 45 times more. For, so each like flower that they did the science to. <laughs> each alter, each restore. Perfect. No, it's altered, A. What did Thais and Adler do as do as part of their study that most directly allowed Thais to reason that bees were repelled, not by the fragrance itself? They let the beetles like crawl all over it. They observed the behavior of beetles and bees both before and after the flowers opened in the morning. <laughs> They increased the presence of one four times only during the August flowering. I don't know. I remember August. They compared the gourds that developed from naturally pollinated flowers to the gourds that what? They gave they gave the bees a chance to choose between beetle free enhanced flowers and beetle. I think it's D. Like A, B, and C seems hella random, but we'll check the lines too. Uh, okay, so the reason why the bees were repelled not by the fragrance itself was let's see if twenty twenty eight A can answer that. I could probably use the line rule, but I already scrolled to this page, and so and that would expend too much energy. So every half hour through the experience, they, t they plucked all the beetles off the ha off of half the fragrance and half and half the control. Up. Okay, so that looks like a great pair for 27D, but we'll keep checking. 51 to 53, uh, 51. Finally, they pollinated by hand half of the female has each. And they didn't. Okay, so I don't think that it matches with D, which is like the only contender. I, s I think you could say that it matches maybe with like, I don't know. Uh, You'd have to like infer something like I guess with if you want to match with like A, B, or C, like they wouldn't match perfectly. Fifty-nine to sixty-one. You'd be out there at four in the morning, three in the morning. <laughs> yeah, so this is where they want me to like match that with the morning, the one that they talked about in the morning. But yeah, if the answer choice is mentioning the word morning, that's not good enough. It's mentioning a lot of other words, so yeah, got to make sure all of them check out. Seventy-six to seventy-nine. Gourds that developed from by the way. Oh, again, yeah. So I think that they kind of want this one to match with the answer choice that says gourds. But this is not talking. This is not answering the question in twenty-seven, right? Where they're talking about how they knew that the bees were repelled, like not by the fragrance. So the only one that answered that question is twenty-eight A, which matches perfectly with twenty-seven D. So let's go. Twenty-nine. The primary function of the seventh and eighth paragraph, line sixty-five to eighty-four, is to sixty-five to eighty-four. So they talk about like. What they found in paragraph sixty lines, paragraph starting with line sixty-five, they added up the nitrogen and the gourds that developed. Is it talking about the results and kind of both? Summarize their okay. I think it's A. Describe no. Illustrate it's not their hypotheses in B. Illustrate their methods. No. Nah. Explain Theus and no. It's like what they actually found, right? So A. In describing squash bees as indifferent, the author most likely means that they didn't care because that's what indifferent means. Could not distinguish. I don't think being indifferent means you can't tell a difference. Visited enhanced flowers and normal flowers at an equal rate. Maybe, assuming that equal is not too extreme there. Largely preferred normal flowers to enhanced flowers. That's not what indifferent means. We're as likely to visit beetle infested enhanced flowers as to visit beetle free enhanced flowers. Let's figure out if it's B or D, it's gonna be one. So we need to figure out if they are either going to, if it's the, if they're indifferent either about enhanced the, the smell being enhanced or the number of beetles. I think it's B already without going back to check because they said that the beetles had like a negative impact on the, whether pollinators visited, but let's just double check. 968, we're indifferent. Okay, so when they saw the fragrance enhanced blossom, pollinators to their surprise did not prefer the highly scented flowers. Squash bees were indifferent. So they're talking about the, the smell. And I lost what question we're on. Good job. It's 30, right? Okay, so in describing squash bees as indifferent, yeah. So I think it's going to be B. According to the passage, Theus and Adler's research offers an answer to which of the following questions? Okay. Well, it's going to be towards the end, right? Given the line rule. So let's see. How can it increase the number of visitors? Mm, I'm not sure. Why is there an upper limit to the intensity? I think I mean, that is the last paragraph's main idea, so maybe. Why does the hand pollination rescue... The fruit weight of what? Okay, I'm not sure. Why do Texas gourd plants stop producing fragrance attractive to pollinators when bees are present? They don't stop. They don't stop though. So not D. Let's see if we can backdoor. I think I want to start with 32, like bottom up, because we're at the end. So 85 to 86. The new results provide a reason that Texas gourd plants never evolved to produce a stronger scent. Interesting, really. Huh, okay, so I think 32D, right? That matched with 31, why is there upper limit? B, 31B, 32D. Onwards. Okay, so we got a Lincoln one and we got a row one. 
Let every American, every lover of liberty, every well-wisher to his posterity swear by the blood of the revolution never to violate in the least particular the laws of the country and never to tolerate their violation by others. As the patriots of 76 did to support the Declaration of Independence, so to support the Constitution so to the support of the Constitution and laws, let every American pledge his life, his property, and his sacred honor. Let every man remember that to violate the laws, to trample on the blood of the Father, and to tear the character of his own and his children's liberty. Okay, he cares a lot about the law. Let reverence for the laws be breathed by every American mother to the lisping babe that prattles on her lap. Let it be taught in schools and seminaries and in colleges. Let it be written in primers, spelling books, and almanacs. Let it be preached from the pulpit, proclaimed in legislative halls, enforced in courts of justice. And in short, let it become the political religion of the nation. Let and let the old and the young, the rich and the poor, the grave and the gay, of all sexes and tongues, of colors and conditions, sacrifice unceasingly upon its altars. Oh my gosh, that was like the most repetitive main clause paragraph I've ever seen. There, like every single one was like, respect the law. It's very clear. When I so pressingly urge a strict observance of all the laws, let me not be understood as saying that there are no bad laws, nor that grievances may not arise for the redress, the, for the redress of which no legal provisions have been made. Oh, so a concession paragraph where he's like, okay, I get that there's some bad laws out there. I mean to say no such thing, but, okay, never mind, he's going to contrast, but I do mean to say that although bad laws, if they exist, should be repealed as soon as possible, still, while they continue in force for the sake of example, they should be religiously observed. Okay, we can follow all the terrible laws too. So also in unprovided cases, so also in unprovided cases, if such arise, let proper legal provisions be made for them with the least possible delay, but till then, let them, if not too intolerable, be born with, oh, okay, so at least he says if they're not too intolerable, good. There's no grievance that it's a fit object of redress by there is no grievance that is a fit object of redress by mob law in any case that arises as for instance the promulgation of, ab of abolitionism one of two positions is necessarily true that is the thing is right within itself and therefore deserves the protection of all law and all good citizens or it is wrong and therefore proper to be prohibited by legal enactments and in neither case is the interposition of mob law either necessary justifiable or excusable okay so lincoln's a big fan of the law i get it that's just you Unjust laws exist. <laughs> that was a very clear pivot. Okay. Unjust laws exist. Shall we, content shall we be content to obey them or shall we endeavor to amend them and obey them until we have succeeded or shall we transgress them at once? I have a feeling I know what you're going to say. Men generally under such a government as this think that they ought to wait until they've persuaded the majority to alter them. They think that if they should resist, the remedy be worse than the evil. But, aha. Uh -huh. It is the fault of the government itself that the remedy is worse than the evil. It makes it worse. Why is it not more apt to anticipate and provide for reform? Why does it not cherish its wise minority? Why does it cry and resist before it is heard? Interesting. Okay, so this guy is not a fan of staying with bad laws. If the injustice is part of the necessary friction of the machine of the government, let it go, let it go. Perchance it will wear smooth. Certainly the machine will wear out. If the injustice has a spring or pulley or rope or a crank exclusively for itself, then perhaps you may consider whether the remedy will not be worse than the evil. But if it is of such a nature that it requires you to be the agent of injustice to another, then I say break the law. He said it. Oh my goodness, Lincoln's mad. Let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine. What I have to do is to see at any rate that I do not lend myself to the wrong which I condemn. So he says it quite clearly here, in stark opposition to good old uh, Mr. President. As for adopting the ways which the state has been, as for adopting the ways which the state has provided for remedying the evil, I know not of such ways. <laughs> He's like, the government doesn't even give us a way to fix it. They too take much time, and a man's life will be gone. I have other affairs to attend to. I came into this world not chiefly to make this a good place to live in, but to live in it, be it good or bad. Okay. A man has not everything to do but something, and because he cannot do everything, it is not necessary that he should do something wrong. Okay. Okay. Very pragmatic, I see. A little low on the idealism, but that's not necessarily bad. I do not hesitate to say that those who call themselves abolitionists should at once effectually withdraw their support, both in person and property, from the government, and not wait till they constitute a majority of one, before they suffer the right to prevail through them. Hmm. I think that it's enough if they have God on their side, without waiting for that other one, the other god is the government? Okay. Moreover, any man more, th more right than his neighbors constitutes a majority of one already. Okay, I, that's... I don't know if that's what majority means, but I, I hear you. Okay. Imagine Lincoln contends that breaking the law has, he's like, don't do it. It slows the repeal of, he never said that, undermines and repeals. It's probably that because he said it's like, it's the same as like, I forgot what he said, but it's like, it's like the same as chucking your baby like in a well. Or he was giving some like super negative example. It leads slowly, inexorably. It's, it's not C, that would be like an inference. It creates divisions between social groups. Maybe D, but the social groups, I don't think if he's, I don't think he's specified though. I know he's like father, son, mother, that kind of stuff, but we'll check. Not, uh, 
breaking the law has which consequence on 9 to 12? Let every man remember that it's to trample the blood of his father and Taylor. Okay, I think it's, I'm pretty sure 34 is A. Check the rest. 20 to 23. Uh, Richmond's already gave him the game. Okay, so this is just the part where he's saying, like, we should follow the law, so it's not a negative consequence. 33 to 35. Uh, okay, he's like, st stick with the law, so not a, not a consequence. 36 to 37. Mob loss is bad. Uh, not answering the question, so not a negative consequence of breaking the law. Okay, so then this one's pretty clear. 33B, 34A. Next, uh, 24. Urge most nearly means. When I so pressingly urge a strict observance of all the laws, like like argued for, advocate, perfect, D. The sentence in lines 24 to 28, a primary of which function in passage one? When I so pressingly urge, oh, this is the one where he's like, he's like, yeah, I admit, there aren't, I'm not saying that there are no bad laws, it's just if there are, you should follow them. Raises and refutes a potential counter argument to Lincoln's argument. Maybe, I don't know about the refuting part, but that seems a little strong, but we'll see. It identifies and con concedes a crucial shortcoming of Lincoln's argument. I don't think that it was like a huge weakness, like a crucial shortcoming. It acknowledges and substantiates a central assumption. He's not assuming anything. It anticipates and corrects a possible misinterpret. Oh, I think it's D, because they said it in a very soft way, like possible misinterpretation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty. I was just reading A again, but I'm. I don't think that it's a. Uh, I don't think he's ref like saying that. Oh my God, you're wrong. Like he's agreeing with himself actually, where he's like, Yeah, I'm not saying that there are any bad laws. It's true. So D. Thirty-seven, as used in line thirty-two, observed means. What was the line again? Thirty-two, <laughs> goldfish memory. Uh, should be observed. still while they continue to force for the sake of example they should be religiously observed oh he's talking about the laws okay but i do mean to say yeah they should be followed right targeting win 37a nice in passage two thoreau indicates that some unjust aspects of government are superficial and can be fixed easy i don't think that he ever said it's fixed easily subtle and must be studied carefully I don't remember him talking about studying carefully, but we'll see. Self-correcting and maybe beneficial. I don't know about that. Inevitable and should be endured. Inevitable is a little bit extreme. So let's see what the lines have to help us out with. 45 to 48. Unjust laws exist. Shall we be content to obey them or shall we endeavor to amend them? So he's like, what should we do with them? There's no answer in 38 that says, what should we do with them? So there's no pair for that. 51 to 52. They think that if they should, the remedy be worse than the evil. They haven't even talked to, they, that doesn't specifically say unjust laws, so I'm a little bit like skeptical with that one. I feel like it's, it has the vague problem where if you read just lines 51 to 52, you can't prove that you're answering 38's question. 58 to 59. If the injustice, uh, maybe, is part of the necessary friction of the machine of the government, let it go, let it go, perhaps it will chance. This is interesting because necessary is kind of like, it matched kind of like with the inevitable of, answer, of whatever the previous question's answer choice D was. Because uh, necessary means that you have to have it. It has, kind of has that uh, extreme connotation. So this might justify answer choice 38D, but we'll check 39, 75 to 78. A man has not everything to do, but something. He's like, yo, just let me live my life. I do whatever I want. Don't think that. I, so the only possible pair that I see here is 38D with 39C. Just keeping in mind that 39 has to answer 38's question and that whatever 38's answer mentions has to be supported. Yeah. 40, the primary purpose of each passage is to talk about whether you should follow the law or not. Make an argument about the difference between legal, oh God. Discuss how laws ought to be enacted and enacted. Advance a view regarding whether individuals should follow all the country, okay, it's probably that. Articulate standards by which laws can be evaluated just, and then like C is also kind of extreme, but Lincoln's point of view was like, you literally need to follow all the laws, even though bad ones, like as long as they're not too intolerable. And same with the other dude where he was like, well, there are some bad laws, should we follow them or not? So I think that the all here isn't necessarily in the, like a sign that it's is incorrect. I feel like it's still saying the truth. So see, based on the passage, Lincoln would most likely describe the behavior that Thoreau, Thoreau recommends in line 64 to 66. But it is not such a nature that requires to be agent of justice. And say, break the law, Lincoln would be like off with his head or whatever the democratic equivalent of that would be. He, would, he wouldn't be very enthused. An excusable reaction? No way. A rejection of the country's prosper? Maybe. An honor? No way. A misapplication of the core principle? He didn't say the Constitution part, so I think it's B. Yeah. I don't think he's like, oh, when you're breaking the laws, like you're kind of, you're, you're not understanding the Constitution properly. No, he would just be like, dude, that's totally wrong. What are you? Based on the passages, one commonality in the snazzy Lincoln and Thoreau take towards abolitionism is that, 
I don't know, they both mention it at the end or something. Both authors see the cause as warranting drastic action. I don't think Lincoln said that. I know the second guy was like, yeah, you should immediately break the law or whatever, but I think Lincoln was just like, either these abolitions are right or like they're wrong, in which case they should still follow the law. <laughs> both view the cause as central to, no, I don't think so. It's about at the end of the, each passage, right? Neither author expects the cause to win widespread acceptance. Neither author embraces the cause as his own. Okay, so I have to substantiate. So between C and D, I think I have to prove the one that has the most like um, proof. Now, it's hard to find negative proof. Like I'm trying to find proof of that they didn't say anything. So I suppose under that umbrella, it could be both of them. But the neither author expects the cause to win widespread acceptance. seems to add in a lot of like stuff that I don't remember reading about the expectations uh, uh, regarding the certain cause. The widespread acceptance part, I, feel, I felt like wasn't really something that they brought up. So I think it is deep. I'm going to go back and check just to make sure that they're not like, I'm an abolitionist too or something like that. I don't remember them saying that. Let's see. Yeah, in the, in the Lincoln last paragraph, he's just like, yeah, like I was saying, he's, just, he's like, abolition's either right or wrong, in which case you should follow the law. He doesn't say that he is one. I do not hesitate to say that those are the ones that affection. Yeah, he, he actually, even in the second paragraph, he even specifically says those who call themselves abolitionists, so d directly supporting the idea that it's not his own cause. So I'm going to say D here, I think. We shall see. Future me will, I'm sure future me will be thrilled to correct me. <laughs> Solar panel installations continue to grow quickly, but the solar panel manufacturing industry is in the doldrums because supply far e equal exceeds demand. Oh, that's too bad. The poor market may be slowing innovation. <laughs> the poor, I just smiled because it said poor when I was like, oh, it's sad, but I'm not, I'm pretty sure they didn't mean it that way. The poor market may be slowing innovation, but advances continue, judging by the mood. This week at the IE Photovoltaic Specialist Conference in Tampa, Florida, sorry, people in the industry remain optimistic about its long-term prospects. The technology that surprised almost everyone is conventional crystalline silicon. A few years ago, silicon solar panels cost $4 per watt, and Martin Green, professor at the University of New South Wales and one of the leading silicon solar panels, cost $5. <laughs> declared that they'd never go below one dollar a watt now it's down to something like 50 cents a watt and there's t talk of hitting 36 cents per oh my goodness the u.s department of energy has set a goal for reaching less than has set a goal of reaching less than one dollar a watt not just for the solar panels but for complete installed system by 2020 well we let we live in the future now. We can, someone can tell me if that actually happened. Green thinks the solar industry will hit the target even sooner than that. If so, what would bring the direct cost of solar power to six cents per kilowatt hour, which is, if so, that would bring the direct cost of solar power to six cents per kilowatt hour, which is cheaper than the average cost expected for the power from new natural gas power plants. Cool. All parts of the silicon solar panel industry have been looking for ways to cut costs and improve the power output of solar panels, and that's led to steady cost reductions. Green points to something as mundane as the pastes used to screen print some of the features on solar panels. Green's lab built a solar cell in the 1990s and set a record efficiency for silicon solar cells, a record that stands to this day. To achieve that record, he had to use he had to use expensive lithography techniques to make fine wires for collecting current from the solar cells. But gradual improvements have made it possible to use screen printing to produce ever finer lines. Recent, recent research suggests that screen printing techniques can produce lines as thin as 30 micrometers, about the width of the lines Green used for his, for his record solar cells, but at far costs far lower than his lithography techniques. I literally like, almost stopped paying attention in the middle of that. Meanwhile, researchers at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory have made flexible solar cells on a new type of glass from Corning called willow glass, which is thin and can be rolled up. New glass paragraph. The type of solar cell they made is the only current challenger to silicon in terms of large-scale production, thin film cadmium telluride. Flexible solar cells could lower the cost of installing solar cells, making solar power cheaper. Okay. One of Green's former students and colleagues, Jan Hua Zhao, I apologize, co-founder of solar panel manufacturer China Sunergy, announced this week that he's building a pilot manufacturing line for a two-sided solar cell that can absorb light from both the front and back. The basic idea, which isn't new, is that during some parts of the day, sunlight falls on the land between the rows of solar panels in a solar power plant. The light reflects onto the back of the panels and could be harvested to increase the power output. This works particularly well when the solar panels are built on sand, which is highly reflective. When a one-sided solar panel might generate 340 watts, a two-sided one might generate up to 400 watts. Oh my goodness. He expects the panels to generate 10 to 20% more electricity over the course of a year, which is nice, okay. 
Even longer, Green is betting on silicon, aiming to take advantage of the huge reductions in costs already seen with the technology. He hopes to, inc to greatly increase split infinitive for shame to greatly increase the efficiency of, solar panel, of silicon solar panels by combining silicon with one or two other semiconductors, each selected to efficiently, split infinitives, each selected to efficiently convert a part of the solar spectrum that silicon doesn't convert efficiently. I don't know if they were split infinitives earlier because I was like dazing out. The, the, it, it was, the content of the past was so interesting that I was dazing out is of course what I'm gonna go with. Uh, each selected to vision convert, blah, 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 blah. Adding one semiconductor could boost efficiencies from the 20 to 25% range to around 40%. Adding another could make efficiencies as high as 50% feasible, which would cut in half the number of solar panels needed for a given installation. The challenge is to, pr is to produce good connections between these semiconductors, something that may something made challenging by the arrangement of silicon atoms in crystalline silicon. Oh my goodness. Okay, that was quite dense. I'm sure that there are many much smarter people who appreciated that passage to a far greater extent than I did, but it is what it is. All right. 43, the passage is written from the point of view of a scientist, consumer evaluating, is not, I don't know why he's a consumer, scientist comparing competing, I like the scientist part, but I don't know about the competing research methods, because if you're talking about like silicon versus whatever the other thing was, the, the willow glass thing, like, those weren't research methods, those were innovations. Journalist enumerating changes in a field. Hobbyist explaining the capability. He's not a hot. I think it's C, weirdly. I think it's C, because I feel like College Board's probably going to be like, oh, they're, they're going to they're gonna see the word scientist and go for it. I, and, but without checking the rest, like the research methods part. Line four, poor? It doesn't mean sad. The poor market may be slowing in a bit. It's like a bad market. The weak market, humble, pitiable, up. It's not pitiable, okay. It's weak, right? Because that's the word you use for like uh, economy that's not doing too well. Eh? It can most reasonably be inferred from the passage that many people in the solar panel industry believe that. No idea. Backdoor. Let's see which one mentioned, answers 45's question. One, two, three. The solar panel manufacturer is in the doldrum. I don't think that says what they think. 10 to 15. A few years ago, silicon solar panels cost that. Declared they'd never go below that. Aha! I think this might be a trap because the question in 45 is asking about people in the industry and this one's just talking about a dude. 22 to 26? If so, that would bring the direct cost of solar as it, this still doesn't mention the people, I think. I mean, we'll see if it is actually B, in which case I'll be kind of sad, but 27 to 30? All parts of the silicon panel industry have been looking for ways to cut costs. I think it's that. Oh, I think it's that. They've been looking for ways to cut costs and improve power outputs. Cut costs, improve power outputs. I think 46 is D, and 45 is C? Yeah, I think 45 is C, 46 D. That's the, I'm going to go with that pair, because I could see how 46 A, B, and C are all traps. 47, according to the passage, two-sided solar panels will likely raise efficiency by... It doesn't capture the reflected light. Oh my god, I actually um, remembered something. It might be, might be B, requiring little energy to operate, I don't know, being unreasonably in, inexpensive, meh, preventing light from reaching the, I don't think it's D, but we'll see what 48 has, so we'll sort of backdoor. 58 to 60, which isn't new, sunlight first falls during that. It's not talking about how they're going to increase efficiency, it, it just says that sunlight's going to fall between them. It doesn't answer the question at the top. The light reflects back on, but could be harvested to increase the power output, maybe that. 63 to 64. This works particularly well when the solar panels are built on sand, which is highly reflective. This doesn't talk about increasing efficiency necessarily because it has the vague aspect, right? Like when it says this works well, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, last, where, which one is this? Oh my God. Okay, it's, it's a D, so 6466. Let me check that. Where one sided might generate that, two sided might generate. I think it's going to be B. It was the one that said that like it, it'll catch the reflected light. 61 to 62, was it? Yeah, I think, I think. 61 to 6, 48 is B, and then 47 is preventing light from, no, B. I think it's BB. Betting on, 69, he's betting on. Wasn't he like betting on silicon? Betting on silicon, yeah. Not yet, it's D. He's, he's, he's like positive about it. The last sentence of the passage mainly serves to. The challenge is to choose good connections between semiconductors, something that's made challenging by the, okay, so the, he's like, that's the thing that we need to work on or something. Express concerns about the limitations of I don't I don't know if he's like worried. Identify a hurdle that must be overcome. Maybe the must is a little strong. Make a prediction about the effective use of certain devices. Introduce a potential new area of study. I think it is. 
I think it's B. Yeah. We'll see. According to figure one in 2017, the cost of which of the following fuels is projected to be closest to the 2009 US average shown in figure two? 2009 US average is 120. Which one's at 120? Advanced nuclear? Figure one, 2017. In 2017. I'm going to go with that one, I think. Okay. According to figure two, what year is the average cost of those equal? 2020. 2020. Good. Oh my God, I have to go use the restroom. Bye.